imagine that actually they had invited a mad person. Imagine I'm absolutely not here to talk to you about global governance, but I'm here to attack you and to shoot at random in the room. What happens in that case? I'm going to kill people, I'm going to wound people. So you try to run away, you step on each other, you try to crawl out of the room. The first reaching the door, of course, will have the highest chance of surviving. So basically, it's a competition for your lives. You're running for your lives because the faster you manage to go out of the room, the safer you will be. Total panic, general panic. So never mind the weakest, never mind somebody who falls on the floor. You step on him, he's not quick enough. Never mind for the pregnant lady. She's falling to the ground. It's your survival instinct that, that speaks here. No thinking, just running. You run. You run for your lives. I see the security guys here that are starting to be a little fidgety here. So if I keep on shooting, what happens? Well, the good news is that some of you are going to get organized to uh, disarm me. They are going to get organized and coordinated in order for, uh, in, in order to um, uh, get to me so that I will stop putting the group at danger. They are going to overcome their uh, individual survival instincts. They are going to get organized together and they are going to cooperate. This is the good news. We know how to cooperate and we can cooperate. Now, what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is that we all have the same reptilian brain. When our direct survival is at stake, you don't think in the same way. You just consider that other people are competitors. And it's just fair. You consider that it's the law of the strongest. It's natural. It's in your guts. It can become very violent. And sometimes competition leaves the weakest on the ground. But also, cooperation, doing something together is not so easy, not so quick as a process to be started, but it's usually much more efficient. So, working together, cooperate, what does this mean? It means to go beyond your reptilian brain to use newer areas on your, in your brain, newer in evolution, you know, the areas of your brain that allow you to feel empathy for others, because cooperate comes from Latin, meaning uh, uh, being involved in a common work. You're not against the others, you're with the others uh, to reach a common goal and to do shared actions. I don't mean to oppose competition and cooperation. I'm sure that they are compatible and actually I think that they are complementary. But I do think that today in our society it is vital to understand the competition that we've been exposed to ever since we were kids, all our society is turned towards this competition, starting at school. You have your grades and you have the ranks in the school. If you don't obey the school teacher, you're punished. If you don't remember your lesson, you're punished. If you copy what your neighbor is doing, you're punished. While you were just trying to get an inspiration from him or to do something together. At school, they call this cheating. They don't call this doing things together. And it's the same later, same pattern in companies, same pattern among companies, that's competition. Part of our society is uh, based on this competitive model, all the way to uh, our consumption patterns. We are always encouraged to have more than the neighbor, to be different, to be higher. And it's the same among the nation states. There's also competition. Competition is everywhere, and we're not even aware of it anymore. So think about this for a minute and try to find one area in our society where there is no competition. Well, so the question is when do we work together to design another society to do things differently? Some of us have already started. And today you have a lot of, exam of examples of corporations, of people doing things together. I don't want to sound too alarmist, uh, too negative. A lot of things are happening. So you can really take your inspiration from what people do at the local level to do things at a broader scale. I'm the founding member of a collective which is called Open Democracy. 
démocratie ouverte. Ouverte, and we experiment and promote new forms of democracy and governance. More transparency, more involvement, and more collaboration in the modes of governance. This collective is based on the open source environment, which totally reinvented the way people were organized to uh, run or develop some websites or some softwares. You know, they moved from the vertical method based on copyright, on secret, on merchandisation to an open method based on transparency of the codes, uh, based on free participation to the project and based on collaboration for the common good. And uh, open source reinvented the way we organize ourselves to create a software. So could we maybe reinvent the way we are organized to make decisions, to act uh, with the common good as an objective? Could we maybe follow that same model and shift from a competition-based society to a much more open and collaborative society? This is really the question that I've been working on, that I've been thinking about today. This is the World Forum of Positive Economy. And in economics and in the social areas and in governance areas, don't you think that being positive would be to uh, rebalance the, uh, the proportions between competition and collaboration. Don't you think we should move from doing something against to doing something with somebody else? Don't you think that we could invent and implement a, government, a governance system in which we would decide that we agree together on the rules of the game? And then, if we all are on a level playing field, there could be competition. It could be rules um, uh, 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 or, or, or common environment, and it could be rules about the global scale, when decisions have to be made at the global scale. So agreeing means that we should decide together and have a common governance. And if you look at what governance looks like today, well, it could be this. That is, you see, you've got the nation states, which are in competition with one another. A lot of them are struggling to survive. That's their primary concern. And among these nation states, you've got different modes of governance. You've got monarchies, you've got republics, more or less democratic. You've got dictatorships, you've got other authoritarian systems, you've got relig religious governments. So this is a very happy mess, I would say. And uh, then there are different systems to appoint the national representatives. So every time they have to make a decision outside of their borders, they have to agree on an international system of decision making. I don't know if you uh, saw the movie yesterday. It was Il était une forêt, Once Upon a Forest, last night. Well, it demonstrated that we're not capable of acting together to protect our primary forest. Well, they are the lungs of the planet. Now, so the decisions about the world are made in international institutions by representatives with or without a legitimacy from 191 nation states, 25 of which only are considered to be mature democracies. And actually, France is not one of them. France is considered to be an imperfect democracy. These international institutions are not global and are not democratic. We say international. It means that the uh, representatives of these nation states uh, are there to agree. And usually one of them can freeze the whole process. So usually what they come up with is statements without any binding effect and without any real effect. Just look at what's happening uh, for climate finance, management of global resources, um, respect of human rights. What have they done? Well, things are going in the right direction. Some things are going in the right direction, but I think we're, we still have a long way to go. We're still not there. Now, on this graph, uh, the representatives from nation states are supposed to represent the general interest. That's what members of parliament do. But actually, they would only represent their country's interest here, the interests of people living in their countries. And some don't even have this mandate. And they usually represent uh, the interests of a group of people or a family or interests of um, somebody else, depending on where their interests lie at the, at the moment. So there's something that keeps me awake at night 
which is that who is democratically appointed in such a system to defend the general interest at the scale of the planet? Nobody. Who represents the interest of the planet itself, of uh, animals and plants that live on the planet? Who is there to represent the interest of the future generations? Actually, I think that with this world governance, which is so little efficient, it's normal that it's not politicians that have the power to influence the world, but other players who operate on a global market, who usually defend private interests, who try to become more and more influential, multinational companies, financial institutions. I'm not criticizing these people, these companies, or the lobbies who try to increase their influence. I'm not trying to excuse them either. I'm just saying that in this world, if we don't have a global rules that would be defined democratically and collectively, well, it's only fair that we see this type of scavenging behaviors that are uh, total, in, in total opposition with the respect of human rights or uh, uh, the respect of the environment. Some people actually think that there is some kind of global oligarchy that would be pulling the strings behind the scenes and that would want everybody to be divided in order to have power. No, I don't think it's that. I think we have a, a headless system that self-maintains itself and that is absolutely not under control. And today it's a system that's not working. And I haven't found any serious institution that would have been dedicated to building a new system at the scale of the world. So the question that we have to answer all together is, when are we going to go from being divided into cooperating together in order to better go govern? So when are we going to set up a cooperation, constructive cooperation approach to build a global democracy instead of all these competition democracies that we have today. Now you've seen uh, the principles of an open democracy on my first slide. I think we could figure this at the scale of the world, because what does this mean? It means transparency, providing access to public data to as many people as possible in order to have what the Brits call accountability. That is, anybody could be able to check what their leaders or companies are doing. Transparency about data and transparency about the governance processes. It's also about opening the door to as many citizens as possible to be involved, and also being organized so that the citizens would really have the power, the capacity to be involved in the decision-making process and in the implementation of the decisions. Our collective Démocratie Ouverte brings together project leaders who try to find solutions going in that direction. It's only a drop of water in the ocean, but I'd like to list a few of them for you. For example, you've got Vox.org. This is a tool to compare political programs, and so you can actually compare them before an election, and you can check afterwards if the promises were kept. You know, it's, it's what I was telling you about, transparency. Another one is questionnezvoselus.org. So that's basically ask your politicians a question.org. So you've got uh, actually people who can ask questions to their politicians, to their local political representatives, and there it's based on a trust relationship. Then you've got another platform which is called Influent, Influential by which you can calculate, increase, and uh, valorize your uh, citizen commitment. It's called empowerment. How do you empower the citizens to be involved in the public policies and to uh, act uh, for the common good? And I'm the co-founder of an association which is called SmartGov, which has two main projects. The first one is called Parliament and Citizens, Parlement et Citoyens, 
and it's a platform which is dedicated to the members of parliament and the senators so that they can co-construct their law bills and drafts uh, with consulting the citizens because when they're in their offices we don't know which lobbies they are subject to so they're doing this on these platforms and so that the people can actually be involved and the second project that we are going to launch this week is called Candidat et Citoyen. So this one is dedicated to the candidates for the municipal local election who want also to co-construct their political program. So it's the same principle. It's involving the citizens into the program even before it's um, designed, even before it's voted. And with all these initiatives and platforms which you see online arriving every day, you see that actually more and more people are looking for a different way of doing politics, a different way of being involved. Antolin Lonard yesterday was talking about WeShare. It's a group of people, of citizens who are being very active in, in finding other ways of being organized and doing things together in a collaborative way. So all those examples are very often based on the internet and you feel that the internet is really changing the way we get our information, the way we train ourselves, the way we work, the way we communicate. And I think that the internet can also change the way we govern. It should make things much smoother, much more transparent. And also, the, it should enable us to have a global governance. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the internet made me meet wonderful people everywhere in the world who are involved in human open cooperative projects, which makes sense. And when I talk to these people, I really feel that there's a new society which is being built. In the 1930s, Antonio, Gram 30, Antonio Gramsci, an Italian, said, the old world is dying, the new world is not emerging yet, and so this is the a dark time of the day when the monsters are uh, roaming around. And this is where we are today. We don't want these monsters to... Uh, take over, and so we need to be committed and we need to be ambitious. And this is why I've decided to uh, take a turn in my life. So right now, starting next week and during six months, I'm going to go and meet innovative mayors in the cities and the candidates to the municipal election that will take place in France in March 2014. And so I've given myself two objectives. The first thing is that I'm going to hitchhike for this. And I'm going to go all around the country. And every evening, I'll try to sleep at a candidate or a mayor's house in order to talk to them, to discuss with them what the new world could be, what the, an efficient society would be, the positive democracy that a lot of citizens want to implement. I want to discuss that with them. Do you feel this uh, a citizen effervescence in the territories? Do you see the premises of the new world? being built over the ruins of the old one. What do you do? What do you want to do to uh, be part of the transition, to be part of the solutions rather than the problems? That's what I want to ask them, the candidates and the current mayors. And these are the questions that I would also like you to ask yourselves. As you understand, my passion is to uh, design. I'm a designer, so I like to design concrete proposals for a society that could work better. And one of the objectives of my Tour de France is going to be to come up with uh, scenarios for the future. And I want this to be a collaborative thing. So I would like you to send me scenarios for the future. And I will publish them and I will post them on my blog. Send me drawings, pictures of this new world. Uh, your kids could draw what they would like the new world to be. You, your friends, uh, please take your pencils and uh, also please discuss that with the future candidates or mayors that you know. And please invite me at your home so, at your home so that we can design this new world together. And thank you for your attention.